Hey there, Internet Grandpa here. Oh, I see Grams in the background. She said I could see her and she's right. I didn't know that. All right, we're here to read Carry On Mr. Bowditch. We're gonna get into chapter 15. Title of the chapter is Sail Ho! Hey, that's what it says. That night, as their boat took Nate and Captain Prince across the Funko Bay to the Estrella, Nate was still thinking about the legend of Machico. Maybe, he decided, before they weighed anchor, he'd write a letter to Elizabeth. There were several things he could tell her about Lisbon, about the women who sold fish, about the legend of Machico, or perhaps he'd keep that to tell her when he saw her. Perhaps he'd tell her about that, and then they boarded the Estrella. At the first glimpse of Colin's face, Nate knew something was wrong. Even before Colin spoke, Nate guessed that Lim was in trouble again. Nate guessed right. For the third time, Lim Harvey was in the brig. That's the end of it, Prince roared. Hereafter, someone else will drill the men at the guns. He strode below. Colin shook his head. Now we'll have trouble with Lim. Oh, for a good rousing battle with a privateer, or better yet, a running fight all the way to the Cape. That would keep Lim out of trouble. What's the matter with Lim anyhow, Nate asked. Colin shrugged. Lim was just born that way, born to fight. When he can't fight in a good cause, he just fights anyhow. There's no way to stop him. I could spread eagle him and give him three dozen, dozen lashes. He'd just swagger about his work with his back running blood. Nate's stomach churned. There ought to be some other way. Ah, oh, that's good coffee. Collins raked him with a disgusted glance. There isn't. Lim Harvey's born to trouble. He did pretty well while he was drilling the men. That let him work off part of his meanness. Now, heaven help us. The end of May, they stood out from Madeira and headed south. Tom Owens took over drilling the men. Lim glowered and muttered under his breath. His sullenness seemed to hang over the whole crew. Nothing a man could put his finger on, but everything took twice as long as it should. It was almost a relief one day when a sudden squall hit them, and they had the men fighting like demons to reef sails before the mast snapped. Something to struggle against seemed to clear the air. Was there no other way, Nate wondered, to keep the crew in a better frame of mind? That evening after the storm, Nate went to the forecastle. Have we ever talked about what the forecastle is? That's a compartment in the front of a ship. That evening after the storm, Nate went to the forecastle. The men hadn't dried out yet from the squall. Oil skins and jerseys hung everywhere. The stench of sweat and tar slapped Nate in the face as he entered the forecastle. A man who was talking stopped in mid-sentence. Eyes turned, to a, turned a sullen stare toward Nate. Nate said, is there any man here who'd like to be master of a ship someday? From his mighty six foot three, Lim Harvey looked at Nate. When he spoke, his words were respectful but there was an undercurrent of a sneer in his voice. Who wouldn't, sir? But what chance have we got, sir? The same chance I had, Nate barked. In case you want to know, I stopped school when I was 10. I've been sailing by ash breeze ever since. What I've learned, I picked up here and there in my spare time. Now between here and Manila, we're going to have some spare time. Does anyone want to learn some navigation? Tom Owens reached a callous hand and almost broke Nate's fingers with the grip. We're with you, he said. If you can get any navigation in our heads, good for you, sir. He looked around him. If any man, and if any man don't learn what he can learn, he, Lem Harvey, stirred. Tom Owens stopped and then went on lamely. He ought to be ashamed of himself. Lem glowered. You talking to me? Tom hesitated. He was a big fellow, but... Lim towered over him. 
Tom mustered a grin. I'm just talking for myself, Lim. Lim stepped closer and stood nose to nose with Tom. Just talking for yourself, eh? See that you remember that. Nate said, we'll begin tomorrow. Good night. He returned to the deck and walked slowly aft. What had he done? Made more trouble? Well, whatever had happened, he had started it, and he'd have to see it through. Next day, at four bells of the dog watch, when men gathered, Lim was not there. Nate thought to himself, maybe he'll come around. He began, celestial navigation, or sailing by the sky, is what we'll talk about first. All of you know how, when we're close to shore, we figure out our position by landmarks. And you know how, when we're out of sight of land, we figure out our position by, well, we might call them sky marks, the stars, the sun, and the moon. After a little, the men stirred restlessly. Nate felt someone behind him. Out of the corner of his eyes, he saw Lim Harvey glowering. Nate went on talking, trying to make a far-off star seem more important than Lim, Lim Harvey's nearby glare. The weeks passed. Lim still glowered and muttered, but he was not affecting the crew with his mood now. They were standing a little straighter and working a little more smartly. It did things to a man, Nate thought, to find out he had a brain. Near the end of July, the Astria reached the Cape. Johnny shivered. Brr, mighty funny weather for July. Nate said it's winter at the Cape. In July, sir? The weather's upside down, Nate told him. And with a cannonball and a lantern, he showed Johnny how the earth goes around the sun. You see, the axis of the, earth, of the earth from north to south pole leans on a slant like that. So as the earth goes around the sun, first the sun shines straight down on this part, and then that. Along about the end of June, the sun is shining straight down up here, as far north as it ever goes. So north of the equator where we live, it's the beginning of summer. But down here, south of the equator, it's the beginning of winter. Johnny shivered again. I hope it won't be this cold all the way to Manila. Could you imagine that? Leaving summer to go to, to the south and be in the winter? Oh, I want to go the other way around. I hope it won't be this cold all the way to Manila. It won't, Nate promised. After we double the Cape, we'll be sailing toward the equator again. Again, the passage around the Cape of Good Hope meant one long struggle against headwinds. For three days and nights, the watches seemed endless, and the men turned in all standing. They left the storm behind and sailed north into the Indian Ocean. I'm glad it's over, Johnny muttered. Then a bit glumly, he added, but there's always something. I wonder what's next. The what next was a warning cry from the lookout. Nate was on watch when it came. Sail ho! Off the larboard bow! Lim did not wait for a command. He dashed forward, bellowing, All hands on deck and man the guns! Before the strange ship was close enough for a lookout to see her colors, the guns were cast loose and ready for action. But that was not fast enough for Lim. He roared, Get those matches lit! And soon the men stood ready, blowing on the ends of the long, slow-burning rope to keep it lighted. Captain Pierce was on the quarter deck with his spyglass. Nate hailed the lookout. What colors is she flying? The lookout had never seen the colors before. An ensign with the Union Jack and red and white stripes. Some country ruled by England, Nate said. Prince's laugh was a short bark. It's the flag of the East India Company, Mr. Bowditch. Nate felt his face get hot. Oh, I thought it was a country. Prince shrugged. You weren't so far, far wrong at that. There's many a nation without half as much power as the East India Company. They've held their charter almost 200 years. When Queen, Queen Elizabeth gave it to them, she gave them enough power to hold their own against the Dutch. They've still got that power. They can take over land, wage war, and make peace. They've got their own ships, their own uniforms, their own flags. They've got a bigger and better trained army than we ever had. When England got into this war with France, do you know what the East India Company did? They turned over a dozen frigates, well-armed and fully manned. A dozen. A ship 
of the East India Company did not seem interested in the Astria. She held to her course and disappeared. Lim bellowed, Secure your guns! He sounded disgusted. At the sound of Lim's voice, Captain Prince stared toward him. For the first time, Nate remembered that Lim wasn't supposed to have charge of the guns. He saw Lim's jaw stiffen. His face grew sullen. Nate spoke quickly. Captain Prince, I ordered Lim to handle the guns. He was on my watch, and I... Captain Prince said, I see. Send him aft. So Lim wasn't supposed to be handling the guns because he got in trouble and was sent to the brig for a third time. Now the captain thinks that he did, but Nate spoke up and said, I gave him the order to, but I don't remember Nate doing that. I think Nate is trying to protect Lim. Can you imagine skinny little Nate trying to protect the big Hulk Lim? Well, we'll take a break for now. I'll finish the rest of it later. You guys take care. Love you. Bye-bye.